Well, we are going to continue now. Let me back up here. We're going to continue now with a keynote while we're waiting for the score. Uh, and this keynote is on investability, what investors look for in a startup. We are very happy to have an expert with us today on this subject. I'd like you to welcome the founder and director of Investable, Mr. Creel Price. Well, hello. Well, it's a real honour to be here at the, uh, the closing keynote of what is Asia's premier tech conference. It's my third year here at, uh, at TechSource and it seems to just get better and better. And it's also amazing that I'm, I've got to, to talk on a, a topic that's actually very close to my heart, which is all about investability. Essentially, what investors look for in a, uh, in a startup. And when I think about the, the partnership between a, an, an investor and a, uh, and a founder, I, I compare it a little bit to climbing a high altitude mountain. If I was to ask you the question, what was the goal of a mountaineer, what would you say? Get to the top, most people would sort of say, well, if you really think about it, the goal of a mountaineer is to actually not only get to the top, but it's to get to the, uh, down safely. If I was to ask you, who was the first person to have climbed Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world? What would you say? Most people would usually say Sir Edmund Hillary or maybe his Sherpa Tenzing Norgay. Well, it's largely believed in the mountaineering community that it was actually a chap by the name of George Mallory. Nearly 30 years before Hillary and Tenzing Norgay made it to the summit of Mount Everest, this guy is believed got to the summit, but because he didn't make it down alive, he doesn't get the accolades or the, uh, the set of commemorative coins with his face on it. That goes to, uh, to Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. And in business, it's exactly the same. Your job is to build your business and then get down safely, or what we might call start, grow, and exit your business. I like to split the business journey down into eight distinct stages for a couple of reasons. Firstly, is it makes the journey of business a little bit less overwhelming if you can split your journey down into discrete stages. Secondly, if you can recognize what stage you're in, and the success criteria to get to the next stage, you're so much more likely to achieve success. So what are these eight stages that you go on on the founder's journey? Well, the first of the stages is setting the vision. Essentially, deciding what mountain you want to climb in your business. Is it the, the unicorn or the Everest of all businesses? Or is it something more humble that you want to actually just put your kids through a really good school, right? That's, the, I guess, the, the local mountain, maybe. Then you move on to the apprenticeship. How do you actually get, do the training? You know, you wouldn't climb a high altitude mountain without doing some training first. So what are the things that you want to invest in? How do you get the business skills? Hopefully you've had your own business or a startup or worked for one. Maybe you want to get some tech exposure, managing tech projects. You also want to have some domain experience. How do you actually get some experience in the industry that you actually want to work in? Then we move on to the startup, and there's not a more exciting period in the, your life than the first six months of a startup. I remember when my um, my mum used to tell me when I was at school that your schoolhood days are the best days of your life. Anyone have that experience from their parents? And you looked at them as if they had rocks in their head. Well, I'm here to tell you that the startup period of your business is the best days of your life. You'll look back with such fond memories at this early stage of your business career. But it's not long before the startup, which is a little bit like a, um, you know, a base camp in a high altitude mountain, so much excitement, but it's not long before obstacle after obstacle after obstacle starts to hit you and you're in the hard yards. And there's a big difference between spending a couple of years in the hard yards than spending decades that I've seen some entrepreneurs do. There's always going to be some difficulty that you encounter in your business journey. And in fact, if there wasn't some hardships, there would be no uh, opportunity to exploit. Someone would have got there before you. How you know you're through the hard yards is you've reached the foundation. The foundation is essentially when you've cracked your business model. When you've actually come up with a product that customers want to buy at the right price, you can make some margin on it and you can scale it, hopefully not only around in your country, but hopefully uh, globally. 
That's the, the, the magic of finding or cracking your business model. Once you've cracked your business model, you can move on to the next stage, which is the expansion. If the foundation stage is a bit more like the high camp in a high altitude mountain from where you'll do the summit push, that's exactly what the expansion is about. How do you actually now scale this amazing business model that it's taken a while to actually fiddle, work it out? But at some stage, you're going to get to a stage where, as a founder, the business grows out of you, and it, it's pretty, uh, pretty common that some people are really good at that early stage, some people actually uh, are much better at the business building stage, but whatever stage it happens is, at some stage, you're going to recognise that now is the time to actually hand over the reins to a uh, management team, and that's where, essentially, the descent starts in your business. The business will continue to grow, but as a founder, you'll need to actually succeed out and give a management team the keys to actually take it to the, uh, to the next level. And then finally, the last stage is the exit. And the exit is where you'll do some kind of physical or financial exit of the, uh, of the business. And this is not only important for an entrepreneur, someone who starts, grows and exits the business, it's actually important for the relationship between the investor and the entrepreneur. If we map this to the investment stages, at the early stages pre-startup, you're getting some friends, family, fools and uh, founders money. And then we'll move into the seed and the Series A stages, which is where Investable My Business um, focuses. And then we'll move into a Series A round, B round, and hopefully towards some kind of exit, might be a, a share market float or it might be an acquisition or a, a private equity buyout, that sort of thing. Investors invest in your business because they want to get some kind of liquidity at some stage. Sure, they, they, they're interested in the problem that you're solving for customers, they're interested in the mission of where this business could end up, but hopefully somewhere within that five to 10 year period, there will be some kind of exit. So you need to be aligned around that journey as a, uh, as a founder. If I think about my founder journey, it started back in um, when I was the ripe old age of 11. I decided to become the, uh, the strawberry baron of Western New South Wales. In a little farm outside of Cowra, um, which is about four hours west of Sydney, I decided to uh, put in 500 strawberry plants and I sold these juicy, ripe, amazing strawberries beside the highway that split our farm in two. And of course, they sold out like hotcakes. So the following year, I decided to, uh, to, to use this early success and increase production. And I put 3,000 strawberry plants in and I convinced Jeff, our school bus driver, that if I had the strawberries picked and packed by 7.30 in the morning, in return for some strawberries, he would deliver them to all of the shops around town, which seemed to, to work pretty well. And the, the following year, I thought I'd raise the stakes again and put in another 4,000 strawberry plants. And I, um, the farm at the time was going through a pretty severe drought and um, the strawberry farm became actually one of the main income earners for my family. I think I was the only 13-year-old uh, by this stage in my class that was convinced, in my own mind at least, that I was employing my parents. Well, fortunately, uh, God had some, uh, some timely intervention for this overly cocky kidpreneur when, um, when my whole strawberry patch did a bit of a hard yards and it, it caught a fungal disease, and that was pretty much the end of my uh, early business journey. But such is the optimism of youth, I had another seven businesses before I left school, another two at university. And then at the age of 25, back in 1996, I uh, put $5,000 in with my, uh, my business partner, Trevor Folsom, and we founded uh, a business called Blueprint Management Group, with probably what could be considered more hope than promise. Over the next 10 years, we had 10 different businesses as part of that group, not all of them successful, but we had a recruitment and training business, we had a, a financial advice and insurance business, we had a call center and a business, a data analytics and e-commerce, and it took me a long while to realize that I had what I've come to call the entrepreneur's curse. Those people that have the entrepreneur's curse have this startling ability of coming up with these brand new, incredibly exciting, life-changing ideas which makes everything else, including last month's brand new, incredibly exciting, life-changing idea, feel a little bit like a month's worth of sorting through your sock drawer. Hopefully some of you guys have the entrepreneur's curse, but the, it, it's what makes us successful as entrepreneurs, but if you don't go through that founder's journey and the entrepreneur's curse kicks in, you'll do what I did in my business for a while, was turn my business into a conglomerate of half-finished ideas. So it's important to start, grow, and exit your business if you're someone that is quite prone to the entrepreneur's curse. We built that business up to over 1,000 employees, and in, in 2008, we, uh, we decided to, uh, to exit, which was pretty interesting timing because we sold literally the week before Bear Stearns crashed, which was the defining moment of the financial 
uh, crisis where all of the financial markets around the world shut down and we were able to sell that business for $109 million just in the nick of time. And interestingly enough, whilst we'd been trying to uh, raise funding during that journey, the ecosystems uh, back in the 90s definitely don't, didn't, weren't anything like they are today. So we were never successful at raising capital. So from our original $5,000 in each investment, we never had uh, another investment up until the time we actually exited. I then decided to, uh, to use my commercial skills to inspire entrepreneurship around the world in a, a new era I called the entrepreneurance. How do we get more people in business, more people successful at business, and more people using business with humanitarian values? One of those things that I tried to, uh, I started with my wife, we started a foundation called uh, the Kidpreneur Challenge Foundation where we inspire entrepreneurship in eight to 12 year old kids, similar like I had when I was, had my strawberry business this program now runs in Australia and New Zealand. I think there's 1,000 schools that run the program. Over 20,000 kids have started a business through this program, and surely it'll be coming to, uh, to Thailand. One of the other things I did to inspire entrepreneurship was work with some of the, the township entrepreneurs out of Soweto and those sort of townships in South Africa in partnership with uh, Sir Richard Branson. My curriculum runs the, uh, the Centre for Entrepreneurship over in Johannesburg, and every year I'd go over and run the... Uh, the, uh, the graduates through this boot camp uh, experiment, experiential learning program, which was the formation for some of the IP that came uh, later when um, Trevor and I got the band back together. We started um, Investable with a mission that we wanted to be the most active seed investor in the Asia Pacific region. And when I talk about active, I don't mean that we wanted to necessarily do the most deals. It was active about, first of all, doing our pre-investment programs. How can we help the ecosystems be active in trying to actually build better business models? And then our fund or our club of super angels would invest and through their networks, we could be active in trying to help scale these businesses. And then after our investment, we would then run a series of post-investment programs in order to make sure that they could scale. We fast forward to today, um, our portfolio consists of over 75 companies over across six countries. We've been able to achieve a fairly significant rate of return for our investors. And one of the things that I think validates that uh, uh, activity that we actually work with our club members on and our programs is that less than 12% uh, of our startups have failed, which is pretty unusual in the seed stage for those of you familiar with that. But let's now move on to the investability side of things. What makes a startup investable? Well, there's Two things we look at, we look at the qualitative and the quantitative side of the, uh, the data in order to be able to work out whether a startup is investable. And it's not just about the thrivability, can it be the next unicorn? In fact, we're typically looking for a 10x return, and if you do enough 10x companies, you'll probably get the unicorns. But it's equally looking for survivability. Is it a cockroach? So if the funding stops, has this startup got a pathway to profit? Can they get to break even? And I think that's pretty important in this uncertain age that we live in. There's essentially five groups of factors. Uh, the founder factors is right in the center, and that creates at least 40% of our algorithm when we're looking at a startup. Then we look at the articulation factors, move on to the business factors, which are both core and uh, supplementary. And then finally, it's the deal factors that actually bring all of this together. So this is what I'm gonna unpack now, the 16 factors that makes up investability, and hopefully, if you can recognize some of these factors in your startup or where you need to improve, you'll be more likely to achieve investment. So let's kick off with the, the founder factors. Essentially, that's where we're looking for deep experience in business, in your industry. We're looking for your attitudes and your motivations. And what we're not looking for is we've come to call the perfect startup storm. For those of you who have seen the movie, The Perfect Storm, essentially that was where all of the worst conspiring uh, factors created the worst storm in history, and that can happen to your startup if you have these five factors or some of these five factors. Essentially a first-time entrepreneur working in an industry they've never worked in before, launching a business model that's never existed before, that requires critical mass of customers before it's useful to one customer, think a social media platform, and it requires a huge amount of investment before you can get validation, i.e. they can't do some kind of MVP. If you have all of those factors working for you, you're not going to be successful. If you have three or four of them against you, you might need to actually shore that up in order to be able to, uh, to be successful. 
One of the tools that we use in our business is called Fingerprint for Success. Michelle's been doing a number of workshops over the course of the last two days, but it's an amazing tool and assesses the, the, um, the attitudes and motivations of founders. And in Michelle's research that she's, uh, she's looked at founders that have sold or, or started and sold a business for a $10 million exit up to a $1.5 billion exit, and she's compared their results to the standard population, essentially answering the question, can these people, or do they have what it takes to, um, to do that founder's journey from startup to, uh, to exit? We don't do an investment now without going through the fingerprint for success tool. One of our portfolio companies, Canva, who now have just uh, recently achieved their $2.5 billion uh, US valuation, um, actually doesn't employ a, a staff member in their business. They really work closely with the fingerprint for success tool because they've seen such big results. One of the things that these, uh, this, this amazing founder team based in Australia has actually been, um, been great at is self-recognition around their shortcomings around tech. They wanted to build this phenomenal tech business, but as a founder team, they recognised there was a missing gap. So they did a worldwide search and brought on Cameron Adams, and I guess the, uh, the rest is history in the phenomenal growth that they're now in 130 countries, 30 million designs happen on their platform every single month. We now move on to some of the core business factors. The first of those is the business model. How do you make sure you're building something that is not at the bleeding edge, is at the leading edge? How do you actually do something, you get product market fit that is scalable? Sure, you might be growing the customers, but can you actually execute? Then we move on to the, uh, to the industry. One of the things that Investable looks at, we're sector agnostic, and sure, we invest in some of the fat industries, but usually we don't like founder teams that are only working in that industry because it is the latest thing. Think three years ago it was VR. Last year it was probably cryptocurrency. Now it's probably AR and big data. AI and big data, rather. So you've got to make sure that if you are going to be in those industries that you have got real deep knowledge rather than just doing it because that's where all of the investors seem to be investing their money. Then we move on to the competition. We hate founders that stand up and say, we're the only one doing what we do. There's no competition. Honestly, as a seed investor, we're looking for competition. We want to see where there's smoke, there's fire. If there's a really big problem to fix, some other startups around the world should be trying to fix it. The reason why I use this photo of Steve uh, Bezos uh, is because Netflix, you'd think uh, you know, around the world, they're, they're really getting some amazing traction with their video streaming service. But Amazon now has a production budget four times the size of Netflix. So you don't know where your competition is going to come from. And then lastly, we look at the traction. Sure, sometimes you're going to run off the rails. Sometimes it's going to be hard to get those trial customers, get those stickiness of uh, customers. But ultimately, you're going to have to get there. And we're going to drill down to work out whether you've got month-by-month -month growth and it's trending in the right sort of direction. But recognizing that not everything you do is going to be successful. One of the, uh, the uh, companies that we were very fortunate to be the first investors on is uh, Ipsy, has had this phenomenal growth. Essentially, they're a makeup subscription service. When they first started, they used to um, get their products from free from the, uh, from the makeup companies, recognizing that it's a good way for the makeup companies to, uh, to market. That's when they had a million customers, and that's when their, uh, their last valuation was. They've now got four million customers, paying $10 a month, they can distribute it to anywhere in the world, and not only do they get their products for free, the makeup companies actually pay them to give them their products for free to send it to their customers. So you can't get a more beautiful business model than, uh, than what they've been able to create um, in some ways. We then move on to the, uh, the supplementary business factors. Okay, these aren't quite as important as the core factors when we, when we work through our algorithm, but they're still things that we want to actually look at. Starting with the, uh, the risk and compliance. Okay. One of the things that we look at around risk and compliance is, do you regularly report? If you said you were going to do something six months ago, how are you tracking against those figures? And it's okay that if you're not tracking, but we just want to know why and have some kind of exception reporting. If we move on to the, uh, the team and advisors, we don't want to see photos on your deck of people that aren't really that involved. We want to know really who are the people that are going to take the plunge with you on this journey. Are they spending the right amount of time have they got their reputations on the line? And so if you don't have those people, I really recommend getting a board of advice together, getting people with deep industry experience that have got good reputations, probably have been in business before, know how to raise capital. It's going to make a huge difference when you're actually trying to get investment. Then we look at the, uh, the plan and the projections. 
Every deck we've ever seen has this amazing hockey stick projection. So I'm sure most of you here today have got that. We, we, as a seed investor, we really recognise that that's important, but we know that you're probably not going to hit exactly the projections that you, um, that you set out. What we're looking for is your understanding of how those numbers actually stick together. You can't outsource your planning projections. If you're not very financially literate, I really encourage you to actually learn how to do it because even if it's a simple model, that's what investors want to see, that you as the founder understand where the money's going to fall out, how you're going to make money, what you need to spend it on. And then we move on to the tech and the assets. You know, it's one thing that the user interface looks amazing, but we want to look behind the scenes to find out, is this some kind of uh, laptop strung together with an apple on the side? We want to actually look at, you know, it's okay that if your MVP is some kind of white label and you intend to build something later, but just fess up that that's the case. We don't want to discover that sort of thing through the due diligence process. Or if it's going to be in the situation that your tech that you've got at the moment has to be thrown out and rebuilt, that's okay. Again, as long as you actually are upfront with the investors that that's the likelihood and that's what you plan for. One of the things that uh, that reminds me of is in the early days in my business, uh, Trevor and I would probably nine months into business and we, we, were, we were struggling a little bit to get a corporate client. We really believed that we could change the financial services industry. And uh, no matter how hard we tried, we couldn't get any uh, meetings with one of the big Australian banks. But finally, we got this meeting with um, some executives of Westpac. The, one of, I think they're now the largest Australian bank. And I remember walking down Martin Place in, uh, in Sydney for this meeting and we must have done the pitch of our lives because at the end of the meeting, the, uh, the executive stands up and said, well, thanks guys for that presentation. This is exactly what we need. Trevor and I looked at each other, think this could be maybe our big break. And, and he said, well, there's, there's only one problem. We need to start immediately, which of course is music to anyone's ears, particularly when you hear that from a corporate. And um, we said, we can start whenever you want. And he said, great. Well, the first thing we need to do is come out and check out your operations. The warning signal should have been the fact that he'd used the word operations. Maybe we'd talked it up a little bit because we'd started with such a small amount of capital that, and back in the days before there was co-working spaces, we'd spent $100 at a second-hand auction was our entire fit-out from our office. In fact, whenever we'd seen a corporate client, we rarely saw them ever again. Anyway, so walking back up Martin Place to the office, we had $3,000 left in the, uh, in the bank account at the time, and Trevor and I made a commitment that rather than dying a death of a 1,000 cuts that would make this make or break, we'd bet it all on red. So we, uh, we got all of our staff together at the time. I think there was only five people working for us. There wasn't any campaigns running. We got them together and said, guys, by midday tomorrow, we need to turn this place around. And so someone was charged. We're going out and hiring some plants and some paintings and some carpets to cover some of the shabbiness around the office. Someone else hired some computer monitors. We had to hide the, uh, the cords at the back of the desk because we couldn't afford the hard drives. Someone else hired some friends and family to put a campaign together to make us look like we had a little bit of energy and customers. And someone else hired some boardroom furniture. Anyway, when all of this stuff arrived for the next morning, literally for 24 hours, and um, someone had the bright idea that the next door office was actually uh, vacant. So why don't we break into the next door office, we'll put the new boardroom furniture in there, and it'll make us look a little bit bigger. So that seemed to work pretty well, and we must have done another pitch of our lives because we got the business. Westpac became a client. It took us six months before we fessed up with Westpac that fact we'd done this Hollywood set on them. And they said we'd sort of figured as much because the next time we came to your office, all of that cool furniture was gone. But they became a $20 million business for us. Um, we had them for a client for the next 10 years. And I think it just validates that, first of all, you've got to put your best foot forward. And secondly, you've really got to, as a founder, sometimes hustle to get those first customers. We then move into the articulation factors. The first that most investors look at is the investor pitch and the deck. One of the issues with the, the pitch is that all the best orators are the ones that are getting the cash. Just because you're good at a five minute pitch doesn't mean you're gonna be good in that founder's journey over the next seven to 10 years. And likewise, on the deck side of things, just because you're good at graphic design, that you put something sharp, shiny, uh, and short together, is, is, it's, it's going to really uh, be, leave you in good stead in your uh, growing your business. If you are putting a deck together, we really encourage you to probably have it within 12 to 15 pages. Anything more than that, investors are rarely going to uh, use. 
Another bit of uh, proprietary IP we built in order to get around this problem is called the business model blueprint. My business was called Blueprint. We essentially have taken the lean canvas and put it on steroids. There's 40 different elements that we actually look at when we take a founder through this, uh, this process, which I won't do now, but essentially there's, it starts with the desirability. Okay, that's the value proposition, it's all about the customer. Then it moves on to the delivery proposition, which is about feasibility. Can we execute as an employees and a founder team? Then we look at the financial proposition and, and the viability. Have we gonna have enough money to do what we say we're gonna do? And then it moves on to the, finally, the business overview, which is all about durability. Even though we want the founder to start, grow, and exit the business, ultimately we want the business to continue to go on, hopefully, for 50 years and do some amazing things. In order to solve this issue of the pitch competition that seems to permeate every single startup ecosystem around the world, we've uh, invented a uh, program called the Investable Games. We ran one recently in uh, Jakarta. Essentially, 12 of the best startups from the region do 12 challenges over three days to strength test every element of their business model. You get guaranteed investment meetings, and we're, that's what we're doing this for, is to find investments around the, uh, the region where we're, uh, we're currently investing. The investability uh, model that I'm taking you through at the moment, those 16 criteria, 12 of those criteria are each of the challenges that we actually run through, right from every element of your business model to your passionate connection to the problem, your skills and experience, right up to the, uh, the business model articulation. And as you can see there, um, we have one coming up in Thailand from the 15th to the 17th of August. Any of the startups in the room that wish to apply for that, we'd love to, uh, love to hear from you. Which moves us to the last set of the uh, criteria are the deal factors. The deal factors start at the terms. What's your valuation? Is it a safe note, a convertible note, maybe straight equity? And even the terms within the agreement. Um, one of the things that I think is really important at the seed stage where we invest is that the terms are fairly founder friendly. You don't want to lock founders into a situation that's going to prevent them from being able to get capital at the next stage of capital. Equally, one of the things that prevents founders getting uh, the next stage of capital if, if the cap table is very crowded. What do we mean by that? It means too many investors. But also, investors are looking at the type of investors. Just because someone wants to give you the money doesn't mean you should take it. Be really picky. Think about which investors would attract future investors. Which investors can add value to my startup over the course of this, uh, this big journey we're going to take on? And that's where affinity comes in. Honestly, just because it's a great business doesn't mean you should invest because you're going to be with this startup for the next seven years. We need to make sure we like the founder team, we like the business, we like the mission, and we're going to be able to work together. It's not always cuddling quite in that fashion. And then lastly, it's about the exit. It's about having that pathway along the founder's journey from startup to growth to some kind of liquidity event in the future that we can give hopefully the founders a return, but certainly the, uh, the investors a return. But when we're looking for an exit, we're not trying to do what they tend to do in Silicon Valley, that if it can't be a unicorn, we're not investing. We're looking for that 10x. If you start hunting for unicorns, they're very hard to find them. But if you get enough companies in the portfolio like we have, typically you are going to find some, uh, some unicorns. And we're two, you know, nearly going towards three at the moment. One of the ones that's going towards three is, uh, is one of the hottest startups in um, Silicon Valley right now is Brandless. Essentially, it's a consumer play where everything's $3, and they've just launched now $5 uh, products there as well. But it's raised over $250 million. Why have they raised that amount of money? Because of the quality of the other investors and the quality of the founder team. Which moves me now to why we actively investing in Southeast Asia. We've had an office in Sydney for, uh, for numerous years now. We've now uh, been investing in programs in Southeast Asia for the last three or four years. We've now got an office in Singapore and a club of super angels coming out of there. And we're starting to actually uh, deploy some uh, capital in this area. But what, what, what makes it interesting to us? Well, first of all, you know, like everywhere around the world, the internet growth is pretty phenomenal. But here, I think it's especially exciting. Yet the venture capital industry is sort of, particularly in the seed stage, has started to stagnate. There's lots of players, but there's not as many checks being written as you would like at the very, very early stage. Just in the last six months, we've run events in uh, six cities in the area, and, and the quality of founders that are actually are starting to come through really impresses us. And we think, as far as the value of the founder teams and their missions and, and what they can go on and achieve, is pretty phenomenal, which is why Certainly, the, uh, the South Pacific region is, is where we want to be investing. 
So in summary, there's 16 factors of investability grouped in these five areas from the founder factors, the core business factors, supplementary business factors, your articulation, and then finally, the deal factors. So my challenge to each and every one of you is, how can you be more investable as a startup? What are the things that you're gonna put yourself in the shoes of an investor? If you were looking at your business, what would you wanna see? The more you do that, the more likely is you are gonna achieve investment, and I really hope you do. So thank you for your time today. You've been a great audience.